<laughs> That's like on those James Bond movies when they're going to um, blow something up and that automated voice comes on. You're about to die. Every T minus 10. Hug yourself. Nine. And your dog. Eight. I'm right giving you a countdown. Now. Seven. Right about now. Start that music. Start the music. Just a moment. Just a moment. Always a little nervous. Are you ready, dancers? Yeah. Are you guys ready? Oh, and can everybody please mute themselves if they're not muted? Because it's. Well, it's the end of the week. Now, where you been? Well, now it's Feedback Friday. So come on in. Come sit down and stare at your screen. We got a presenter that you never seen. We're Feedback Friday. We're on the loose. We'll be the train. You be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, Feedback, Feedback Friday. Well, hello everyone. I'm back. I'm back from Shake Rag, Tennessee. <laughs> It was fantastic. You guys got to go next year. It is such a great program. Um, if those of you who don't know, Shake Rags at an arts school that is just open for three weeks of the year and they do an amazing job. It's held in Sewanee, Tennessee. It's absolutely gorgeous up there. All right. Well, welcome everyone. It is Feedback Friday, episode 61. Oh my goodness. That is amazing. This is our online show where we meet with artists, dyers, scientists, writers, scholars, growers, activists, everybody to talk about our favorite topic, which is natural dyes and color. Uh, you all know I'm Kathy Hattori, president and head honcho of Botanical Colors, and along with my insanity herself good friend, Amy Dufo, sustainability and communication director at Botanical Colors. We're so pleased to welcome you to today's episode. Today we have multidisciplinary artist and natural dyer Madeline Corbin. Madeline is based in Detroit, Michigan, but when you look at her website, she's done some pretty awesome stuff on the Oregon coast. And her research-based practice moves fluidly between drawing, writing, sculpture, textiles, and natural dyeing. And I would also have to say that she does these amazing installation pieces uh, that looks that look like they were part of a series that she did uh, when she was artist in res residence. Pretty incredible. So check that all out. Madeline will talk today about the climate crisis as a crisis of color. She will share pieces of her research and experiments that have inspired her artwork concerning the imminent loss of the color blue from our surrounding ecologies. Before we start, I wanna send out a huge thank you to everybody. Thank you for putting up with us. It's been 61 weeks of absolute chaos and somehow you've helped us hold it together. Uh, and we really wanna thank you for your incredible support. We could not do this without you. Amy's going to be our moderator and monitoring the chat on this call, which is where you'll post questions after Madeline's presentation. We'll have everybody muted during the presentation, but we will open it up afterwards to say goodbye after the question and answer period and our picture of the week. This call is being recorded and we'll have a video copy ready this weekend, along with any supporting information from this call. And so Madeline, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to Feedback Friday. I'm gonna let you just take the stage and show us your stuff. Thanks so much. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much to Amy and Kathy for welcoming me to present today. I'm super grateful to get to spend time with you in this botanical colors um, space that I admire so deeply. Um, the project I wanna share for this Feedback Friday is really about connecting, um, connecting to color, to each other and to the climate crisis. Um, I'm excited to offer some excerpts from my recent book project, The Stuff of Everyday Magic and a couple of the textile projects that developed alongside. Um, while preparing to share with you, I 
really enjoyed the idea that I'm building on the inspiring Feedback Friday conversations that have come before. Um, I know that I've felt many overlaps between myself and the artists and researchers. Um, so I, I hope that you feel those same connections today. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen and start the visual part of the presentation. Okay. Recently, I was talking with Jordana Martin from Tatter Blue Library in New York, who beautifully illuminated this kinship between a project structure and the structures embedded in weaving. The warps of a project hold taut the architecture of ideas and research while patterns meander and bring light to new intersections in the maker's journey. So today, inspired by Jordana, I'm going to spend the next about 25 minutes offering you the warp threads of research that support my ongoing project. At the same time, we'll weave back and forth wefts of the in-between moments that I find most powerful. To describe my, my color journey, I need to work backwards. I'm an artist currently living in Detroit, but all of my work is informed by where I come from. I was born and raised in Oregon, where I had access to the Pacific Ocean and tall mountains for viewing the blue of distance. I have many memories of feeling small while scrambling up volcanic rock, the volcanic rock of South Sister, climbing through, through the wildflowers of Iron Mountain and sitting on Mary's Peak between the ocean to the west and present day Corvallis to the east. Corvallis is the traditional territory of the Chepanefa band of the Kalapuya. Feeling small and feeling blue aren't usually thought of as positive emotions, but atop of these mountains and in front of the vast ocean, my memories of being small and blue, I actually mean in an overwhelmingly good way. The kind of small and blue that returns the body back to its human proportion instead of existing in cities built around the scale of human bodies. Oregon is where I first fell in love with blue. It's where I first noticed vivid hydrangeas at my grandmother's house and learned about the flower's sensitivity to soil, which makes it express different colors. Oregon is where I hiked to my first fire lookout and felt in my body what it means to be between earth and blue sky above with the cosmos beyond. It's the first place where I felt the crispness of water on my skin at Blue Pool and saw blue depths at Crater Lake. Like some of the best love does, this relationship with blue built in the background of my days. It wasn't until college at Oregon State when color came to the forefront of my attention as an entity in my life. And that's when, years ago, I realized I wasn't just becoming aware of blue, but that I was already embedded within it. I explored my relationship with color during my time at Oregon State and narrowed my explorations to blue specifically at Cranbrook Academy of Art, where I received my MFA in 2020. The images and words that follow trace, trace the paths of a few of these explorations. I am interested in sustaining color before it disappears. At first, this question might sound frivolous. However, I believe that blue is an indicator of climate change. I've spent several years studying natural color and over three years focusing on the capacity origins and imminent absence of blue. Blue is a much broader category than it first appears to be. We have plant-based blues sensitive to oxygen like indigo and other oxygen sensitive blues found in bruising fungi. There are mineral blues, atmospheric blues, cyanotype blues, structural blues, and so many more. To some, blue is a set of conditions, like the way Maggie Nelson writes about in Blue at number 157. Quote, the part I do remember, that the blue of the sky depends on the darkness of empty space behind it. As one optics journal puts it, the color of any planetary atmosphere viewed against the black of space and illuminated by a sun-like star will also be blue. In which case, blue is something of an ecstatic accident produced by void and fire end quote. To others, blue stands out in linguistic histories. A study by Lazarus Geiger compared ancient texts from around the world to find the first mentions of each color and the order in which the colors began to appear. Of the primary colors, a word, first, a word for red appears first, followed by yellow and finally blue. 
it seems to me there is no accident in the order in which colors are named. They follow almost perfectly the wavelengths in the visible spectrum from longest to shortest the world over. It has become fairly common knowledge that Homer's epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey contain zero mentions of the color blue. And though it's been incorrectly assumed that the ancient Greeks could not perceive the color blue at all, the idea did inspire me to consider color as a process and not a permanent ability. As a species that evolved to take in the visible spectrum, it is conceivable that we have not always been able to see the color blue, though this ability likely arrived long before Homer was even born. This becomes especially interesting when considering the fewer rods and cones in human eyes for perceiving blue than other colors. And yet we still have a special sensitivity to blue light. Clyde Keeler, an American geneticist who initially studied the eyes of blind mice, discovered that although the mice completely lacked the photoreceptors that enable mammals to perceive light, their pupils still con contract in response to it. Nearly 75 years later, it was definitively proven that everyone, including the colorblind and the non-sighted, are able to distinguish bluish light. The blue light of the morning, that early crisp light, is what sets our circadian rhythm in motion, allowing us to stay awake during the day and fade to sleep at night. The special receptors we have for absorbing blue are unique to this color. Perceiving blue is delicate. My partner builds controlled environment agriculture, hydroponic farms in Detroit for leafy greens and herbs. Spending time in the farm is one of the first places I noticed acutely how sensitive color perception is. I frequently visit the farm and I'm always enamored by the violet light that floods the space. While walking the leafy aisles of cilantro and dill, I notice my eyes slowly adjust to the room. The plants initially drenched in fuchsia light begin to appear dark green as my eyes and brain work to neutralize the effects of the colored light. Over time, the purple glow dulls to resemble warm daylight, though nothing in the grow room has actually changed. When I leave the room and open the door to the fresh air outside, the world is tinged with green like looking through tinted glasses. Soon the green fades and the colors that feel normal return to my best memory of them. After my first visit, I remember wondering, how long might I have to stay in a glowing fuchsia farm before the light colonizes the normal of my vision, before the effect is permanent? How ephemeral is color and my perception of it? If sight and color perception are so fragile, so precarious, what other senses are also so? The color we are immersed in affects our perceptive abilities. I notice my vision shift within a handful of minutes in the fuchsia light of the CEA hydroponic farm. What might happen to this ability to perceive color if our environment outside slowly and subtly changes over time? What if our environment is already changing and has, al and has already changed to the ways we see color? The color field of our environment and our perceptive abilities are inextricably linked. I suspect if we lose a color, our senses and our vision will invariably evolve. The dulling of the sky is no longer a vague question for the distant future. Pollution, geoengineering experiments to block the sun, temperature and humidity levels, the list of reasons goes on. Like a dulling sky, the blue ocean is not constant either. It is theorized that in the next 100 years, the blue of the swelling sea will noticeably begin to green. It is said that from space, this change will be visible with the naked human eye. At a time geologically, when our planet should be cooling, we've just survived the warmest decade recorded in human history. As our waters continue to acidify around the globe, is it possible that we will lose blue on land too? That the blue of flowers, the blue of the skies over polluting cities, the blue of the ocean will be lost. So what is blue? It's vast, it's delicate, it's violent, it's not constant, it's a set of conditions. Prussian blue, an iron cyanide was discovered in Germany in 1704. Cobalt blue, a carcinogen, was discovered in 1802 in France. Companies had been looking for a new blue for over 200 years, 
when in 2009 in the chemistry laboratory of Dr. Moss Subramanian, a new blue was accidentally discovered by graduate student Andrew E. Smith. At a time when blues are largely becoming endangered or extinct species, Moss was able to welcome a new blue into the world. And in 2019, another new blue, Hebonite. In 2015, I became a research assistant and artist in residence in Moss's lab. I felt a similarity between the lab and the studio. Both places invite serendipity and reward careful attention. My time in the lab was an, was an informative window through which my attention was directed toward blue. The lab inspired me to learn about organic plant-based color and natural dyeing. In 2016, I headed for the waterways of New York City to work with Mary Mattingly on her project, Swale, a floating food forest. Mary's a visual artist whose work engages the public and offers new ways of looking at the ecologies we are a part of. Throughout the summer, I helped Mary and the many teams that work with her to convert a floating barge into an edible and medicinal forest of plants. It would eventually move through the waterways of New York and provide food to the public at no cost. One day on my way to the barge, I noticed a cornflower growing vivid and blue. There was something different about this particular cornflower's blue. It reminded me of the blue I made in the lab. Instead of mixing an amalgam of yttrium, indium oxide and manganese at extreme temperatures, this blue grew organically from the soil all on its own. Later that summer, I submerged a piece of cloth into a natural dye vat saturated with blue cornflower petals. Expecting a blue cloth to emerge, I was astonished when the fibers appeared light orange and green. The Centauria genus contains 450 to 500 species of flowering plants in the Asteraceae family. One of those plants, cornflowers, were considered a weed in their native habitat in the temperate regions in Europe. There they could be seen spotting the fields of wheat and other grains until farmers started using herbicides and the species became endangered. Today, they've naturalized in the US. Cornflowers in healthy soil grow vivid and blue when given pH neutral water. However, like roses and hydrangeas, cornflowers possess a co-pigmentation complex due to their protocyanin pigment. Cornflower blue is its own crystalline structure that appears blue because of the pH of the flower petals vacuoles. Cornflowers express their protocyanin dye in a range of colors from reddish orange to green, depending on the pH of the dye solution. I began to wonder if it is possible not to alter the color of the cornflower petal dye, but to alter the color of the growing plant. If the water is made slightly acidic or alkaline, will the blue disappear? Will it grow red or even green? How dependent on healthy water and soil is the blue of the cornflower? And how sensitive is blue on land? A sensitive system for finding and losing blue set out to answer these questions. The artistic system I created could not be experienced in its entirety all at once. To initiate the system, users had to work together on opposite sides of a wall. On one side, water could be released by squeezing the nozzle on a canvas bag full of liquid. Simultaneously, on the other side of the wall, liquid could be seen emerging from irrigation tubing. The released water that climbed through the tube, through the architecture, and toward one of six growing cornflowers ranged from an acidic pH of approximately six to a basic pH of eight. The pH of the liquid in each bag was not disclosed asking viewers to participate in a system they could not clearly know the results of instantaneously. Repercussions were separated from actions. The work is slow. It takes time to grow a flower. I watched the plants change day after day, a precious ability when there are many people like my father who are partially colorblind. In one month, the flowers began to bloom. The results were captivating. Much like our oceans and skies, the color in the cornflowers dissolved from blue to purple before all that remained was a ghostly white as the water acidified. My project suggests that cornflowers may be indicators for the climate crisis. And along with other pH sensitive blues, they indicate that the climate crisis is also a crisis of color. In what color is the sacred? Michael Taussig writes, like a river, color is a moving force. And like the world's water supply under the present climatic regime of politically enhanced global warming, color, like heat, 
is now subject to unpredictable oscillations. The project that resulted from my constellation of findings is a system that privileges the slow mysteries of plants over the desire for immediacy. This work is a look back towards history and a speculation forwards into the hazy blue of the distant future. It's reminiscent of a, of a cyanometer, a device from the 1700s used to measure the blue of the sky. While my blues were achieved with mostly indigo, this cyanometer was historically made with Prussian blue. In my project, I'm not measuring the color of the sky, but instead the color of the cornflower as it grows in height. It's a bit um, anecdotal, though much of this is a meandering, but I've started to see cyanometers in my everyday, like when driving around in, into, when driving into Detroit, there's a condensed series of overpasses all painted a sky blue. And on some days they disappear into the background of the sky and on others they are in stark contrast to the gray clouds overhead. Um, I'm interested in these bridges as, as like imperfect cy cyanometers. Um, to, me, to me what's become interesting is that just like our perceptive abilities, the blue of the bridges is not constant. The pigments fade, the binders fail, and the tool for measuring blueness fades faster than the sky behind it. This piece was created by weaving an irrigation tube through wool fibers that dramatically fade to white. The liquid contained in the glass vessel is local water tinted with a pH indicator. The indicator dyes liquid blue when the pH is neutral, suggesting that the cornflowers below um, are being watered with a neutral liquid. The challenge I set for myself was, and still is, to connect the poetics of color with the politics of absence to inspire sustainable action. This is urgent as the synthetic dye and textile industries are largely regulated by the EPA as hazardous waste generators. The long-standing history of color and value is resurfacing today. On December 7th, 2019, Dharma Trading Company sent out an email explaining their inability to fulfill orders for blue, specifically number 23 cerulean and 25 turquoise. Twice the email mentioned a rationing of the blue pigment and an additional rationing likely to follow. Color has become a limited resource. While my primary research is with the natural color found in plants, the issue of blue's disappearance is rapidly growing to include inorganic mineral pigment and chemically produced synthetic pigments and dyes. Dharma concluded with the blues being, quote, a little up in the air, so we're keeping our fingers crossed, end quote. Later that month, number 23 cerulean was temporarily discontinued worldwide. So it's not that we might lose blue, we're already losing it. While Dharma was left hoping, Pantone's color of the year was announced for 2020, classic blue. Like my speculation about the cornflower, the loss of blue in a pH sensitive organism has happened before. Hexaplex trunculus, a pH sensitive mollusk existing in the Med Mediterranean Sea and also um, in the Gulf of Mexico, produced a bright blue dye as early as 1750 BCE by the Minoan people of Crete. Over time, the murex dye molecule has changed from producing blue to purple with exposure to an increasingly acidic environment. This loss of blue suggests the mollusk, like the cornflower, may be an indicator of the acidification of our seas, an indicator of climate change. Two summers ago, my grandmother gifted me a small skein of murex dyed wool given to her over 30 years ago by a family of weavers and dyers who still work with the sea purple today. Her home is covered in textiles collected from decades of travel while she was the curator of traveling exhibitions for a San Diego museum. While visiting her in 2019, we talked about the nature of textile and natural dye degradation in the sun over time. She showed me several weavings that have been around her house for years. They were the ones exposed to the sun on one side and never flipped over all these years. The undersides of these textiles remain vibrant and in high contrast with protection from the sun. My grandmother keeps one textile draped over a chair that she made. It's been there as long as I can remember. I can't help but to think what the textile's colors would look like 
if my grandfather could have been around the last 32 years and sat in that chair that she made for him, what would the pattern look like if he could have been here to block the sun and share more time with my grandmother? Would there be a body shaped area in the center that wasn't quite as faded as the edges? These ideas of presences and absences are themes that repeat themselves throughout my practice. After my conversations with my grandmother and time spent looking at her textile collection, my ideas started to expand to the spectrum beyond blue. Now I'm making my own fading textiles that appreciate as they fade with exposure to the sun over time. The first experiment I did was using a fully fugitive dye that would fade. I wove a simple square and masked off areas before leaving it in the sun. Within days, there were noticeable changes between the exposed and hidden areas, but these photos are probably a month apart. The problem with this experiment is that when the masking tape is removed, the hidden part immediately starts to fade too. And I wanted to find a way for the pattern to develop over time instead of simply fading at different rates. And I wanted to weave the pattern directly into the fabric instead of using tape on the surface. I started developing different natural dyes that appear metameric or the same and began weaving what looked like a very simple textile, mostly bright yellow with squares of white and lines of blue punctuating the yarn that ran forwards and back. When exposed to the sun, one set is more color fast and another is hypersensitive to the rays and begins to fade. This process has allowed me to integrate patterns into the textile that aren't lost to the sun, but develop in it like a cyanotype might. The result is a textile that inverts the desire for permanence and encourages us to value change. This year Pantone named two colors descriptive of the times we are in ultimate gray and illuminating yellow. I see an offering of hope somewhere between these colors moving forward. My goal in connecting the climate crisis with the crisis of color focuses on reestablishing the connection between humans, non-humans, and the climate so that each is rediscovered as being anything but separate. My project as an artist is to challenge our practiced ways of being in the world and to ask, how do we practically engage with sensoria other than our own? What is vital about color, blue, and all the stuff of everyday magic? I wanna end with a quote by Ursula K. Le Guin. Le Guin writes, one way to stop seeing trees or rivers or hills only as natural resources is to class them as fellow beings, kinfolk. I guess I'm trying to subjectify the universe because look where objectifying it has gotten us. To subjectify is not necessarily to co-opt, colonize, exploit. Rather, it may involve a great reach outward of the mind and imagination, end quote. An expanded view of kinship is important in the genuine reconnection of humans to our surrounding ecologies. And color is an important and special place to feel this connection. Um, I'm so glad to have had this time with all of you who I imagine must also have a deep appreciation for color and where it comes from in our world. Um, I hope you enjoyed these vibrating ideas about where it may be going. So thank you all so much for listening so generously. Madeline, thank you so much. My head is about to explode when you started talking about all these different things. Um, Amy, I just want to do a quick shout out to this book, Bluette, right? That's available um, at the Tatter Library, as well as Madeline's book. Uh, tell me the title, Amy, it's all the stuff of everyday magic. Yeah. So there's like, if you like these ideas, you have got to get this book. And um, Madeline, is, is Tatter um, distributing that for you? Okay. Yes. So we'll give you that reference, uh, either both in the chat and also with our email. Um, the other thing that I just was absolutely blown away with was the idea that you're using um, all of these different ways to evaluate blue and the transformation of blue in places that you're looking at or driving through or observing on a walk. That was like another fall over and think about that one. Um, and then the collaborating with the sun. I, I mean, that was my question is, have you ever worked with dyes that actually get darker in the sun? 
like kakishibu darkens um, many many tannins will darken and shift yes um i definitely want to do a lot more of that um yeah i feel like this project is is, is the new one that's why there's so few slides of it but i'm still in that experimenting phase and yeah i'm i'm excited to do a lot a lot more and I'll, I'll have to pick your brain more later about that too oh my god i'm gonna have to pick your brain my dear <laughs> <laughs> this is incredible amy i'm gonna turn it over to you to monitor chat and uh, ask uh, madeline questions but thank you so much this was just amazing thank you thanks kathy thanks madeline i'm i feel like i don't know if anybody else here feels as peaceful as I feel right now, or everybody's people are shaking their heads. You just were talking about terrifying things with the most lovely voice. Oh. So there's a push and pull that's happening right now. I want to run screaming. And yes, I have Madeline's book here, um, Tatter Blue, but you also sell it on your website, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's truly like how Madeline was just talking is how beautiful this book is. It is just gorgeous. So. Okay, hopping in here. Um, I am wondering how you made some dyes more light fast, light fast and less light fast in the last weaving. Are they the same dye materials? That's a great question. Um, so yes, some of them are the same dye materials. Um, and the challenge there is mordanting some and then the unmordanted fibers, how to make them still vibrant to match that color pretty similarly. Um, so that's an ongoing experiment that I'm always working through. Um, and then also it has really been interesting to compare different dye stuffs. So um, for example, a very bright yellow, very fugitive dye would be turmeric. Um, it's going to last seconds, I feel like. <laughs> I feel like it looks at the sun and it starts to fade. Um, and then other dyes like I can use goldenrod or marigold and then adjust with some different modifiers to um, work the color out to be pretty similar um, but last a lot longer. Um, let's see. Um, when you dyed with corn, corn flour, did you use a mordant? Hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm, I did. Yeah, so I tried corn flour dye in a bunch of different um, ways, just playing with it really. I, would, I feel like my experiments with corn flowers, I always call artistic experiments because they feel very playful. Um, but I did try different mordants. Um, there's historically, there was a corn flower blue dye that was attempted to be made by um, uh, Boyle. It was called Boyle's Blue and it was really unstable. Um, and I feel like that's one of the more extensive attempts that's been made uh, to get a really good blue dye out of corn flowers and it it did not last and it did not really get picked up um, to be made at a large scale. Um, so I think there's a lot more room to play around with it. It was kind of abandoned early on, but um, it's definitely a challenge to get blues, blues out of it. I know uh, too, I was going to mention like with safflower, of course, there's like, you can get a couple different colors out of safflower, but like, how, how did you, I mean, when you're talking about the corn flower that itself, have you come across other flowers or plants that you've seen do that besides that's all I can think of. I'm sure Kathy can add more, but I, like for me, I just think of safflower, but there, are there other ones? Yeah, definitely. I think any of those flowers with that co-pigmentation complex, like hydrangeas or roses actually have it as well too. Oh. And I'm sure there are so many more too. I, I wonder about the, you know, butterfly pea flower. Um, yep. Yeah. I think also um, like that uh, super dark scabiosa. Yes, definitely. Uh, that one, it, like a really blackish purple, maybe even black hollyhock. Mm -hmm. Like when you die with it, it will sometimes break into um, a reddish tone that could be anything like you got sort of an orange right and then you get this really strange green thing happening and you're just mystified but sounds like you have a bit of a chemistry background so can you kind of tell us like what what's going on there yeah my well my background actually is as an artist um so when I was that's okay. Uh, just pretend because you know more than we do <laughs> <laughs> well when I was part of the lab um with moss it was it was just as an artist in residence 
um, which was a really fantastic experience. Moss is an amazing human, like such a character, such a wonderful person to have conversations with. Um, but yeah, that background, um, I would say like that chemistry background was pretty siloed into that experience, which was inorganic materials, these rare earth materials, which are kind of mislabeled rare earth doesn't necessarily mean that they are rare. Um, so yeah, that was kind of like that chemistry experience. And then I feel like within the dye world, um, there's a lot that I've just been reading and learning about and continuing to delve into, but um, I don't, I definitely do not have like perfect answers right now for what exactly is happening. I feel like that's what I'm, I've been after. So yeah, still, still in the learning phases of that. Super cool. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, how, do you, how do you determine if it's a new or a different blue? Yeah, so for moss, it's structurally different. Um, it's a, it's a, I think it's a tr trigonal bipyramidal structure. So it's actually the structure itself um, that is different. And in that one, it's a very organized structure. And the newer one that he found, Hebonite, it's, um, what makes that a different blue from the first blue that he found is that structure um, and then how it's made and then also kind of what it, it's really that, I mean, the materials and, and the structure of it, but also the effects that it has are interesting to me. So just to touch on it, like what his blue does is that it's much safer. So it's not carcinogenic. It's, um, it's yeah, it's safe to use and to touch. It's also light fast and heat resistant. So there are quite a few practical applications too to these, these new blues that he's found. Um, and he's gone on to discover uh, a whole host of new colors, not just blues. Hmm. Kathy, did you want to ask ask your question or do you want me, you want me to ask your question? Oh, you can ask it, that's fine. Okay, I mean, you've got that lovely voice as well. Uh, have you ever worked with dyes, pigments, or inks that are intentionally disappearing with light or pH exposure? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah some. Um, I've been really interested in some that change in the sun, obviously. Um, <laughs> some pigments that do that. Um, and those chromatically sensitive or, you know, the heat sensitive ones, the sun sensitive ones, the photosensitive um, they're very interesting, but they don't always retain those properties. So what I like about them is that I think of them as being itinerant, like a sunburn might be, right? Your sun, I'm on my skin at least, when I get a sunburn and it turns bright red and then it fades back to this normal color and it kind of comes and goes constantly back and forth. Um, and I think of a lot of those, the like, like a photosensitive pigment similarly to a sunburn and in that itinerant fashion. The problem that I have with it is that when I've, when I've played with them so far is that they are only itinerant for a little while before they become fugitive. And um, like I have a blue one that turns kind of, or it's like a light green pigment that turns blue in the sun. And it works for a month or two, but then it, um, it just stops working and it turns into this kind of gross green, greenish color. Um, so if I could preserve that ability a little longer. I think it might be more interesting as like a different category for me. Um, but so far, I haven't come across anything that long lasting. So if you if you have suggestions, you know, please <laughs> let me know because it sounds it sounds very yeah. interesting. No, you're like, just making my <laughs> head explode. So I'm asking a lot of questions. Oh, I, I, it's fantastic. I Thank you. You know, I'm wondering right now if people are like telling all their friends to join us because Madeline's talk is so good because people just keep joining, which is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, this one's amazing. Come join them. Um, let's see. Have you worked with Kaki, Kaki Shubu? Shibu. Kaki Shibu. Not yet. Okay. Are the orange and green from the cornflower more color fast than the Boyle's blue you mentioned? No, they're not. Um... I would, I would imagine that Boyle's blue is more color fast and more, much more developed. Um, no, yeah, mine would, it's not. <laughs> uh, your thoughts on fading remind me of Roland Ricketts' current exhibition of used and faded indigo cloth. I'm sure you're aware of that. Is that, did that have any, did that influence you in any way or inspire you in any way? I think um, subconsciously it might have. I wasn't as familiar with with Roland Ricketts' work at that point. 
Um, but I say subconsciously because he came out of the same graduate program that I did. And so I imagine that there's sort of this pedagogical history that maybe was probably embedded in me without even knowing it. Um, and then since, of course, this work, I have like done a deep dive into what he's doing and admire it. It's, it's really incredible that what he does. Mm -hmm. Let's see, um, when dying, do you take into account the water you use or document where the water comes from? If so, what have you learned about it? Yes, 100%. Um, I mean, water, wow, everything comes back to water. Um, in the, the climate crisis is a crisis of color weaving. It's the title, <laughs> like a thesis as a title. <laughs> Don't normally do that, but so that's the blue, the blue weaving that faded to white and in that one, everywhere that it gets installed, that water is the local water from that place. So in my installation, the, in the photographs, it's tinted blue because that water is that neutral color. But if it were installed at a different gallery or location, um, that's the water that gets used in that place. So I do gain information and it does change the color of the installation every time it's moved to a new place. Um, so it also, you know, is a uh, I would say more of a poetic indication of water in that location, right? It's not actually giving super hard information, but it's, um, yeah, it does change. Um, have you died using blue hydrangeas? I have not. I have not. I should try that. But yeah, I have not tried it with hydrangeas before. I'd be curious what that does. Uh, let's see. Well, Deanna, um, Wilkes Gibbs was just saying I had some weird color changes with rhododendrons to ending in that weird gray green, which just blew mm -hmm. my mind. Who are you uh, talking to? Boo -boo? What was that? <laughs> Hold on. Let's see. Um, I'm just trying to see oh. if that is. If you could just mute yourself, that'd be easy. Mm -hmm. Oh, got it. Got it. Okay. Um, let me see, you know, uh, I just got to the bottom of the questions, but I had some questions. Um, can you talk about your, your weaving and kind of like how long have you been weaving and kind of maybe how weaving has trans transformed or evolved for you through the years because of, because of the work you're doing now? Yeah. Um, weaving for me is new. So hence the fairly simple two, two twill, you know, rug <laughs> weaving, um, it's fairly new. It's something I learned in graduate school. Um, I was very lucky to have a generous cohort and learned skills from other people within it, um, which can be a hard thing to do in graduate school is pick up some of those technical skills while you're also really pushing conceptually. Um, so it's fairly new. It's only been a few years that I've been weaving. And I, I really did it because I had fallen in love with color so deeply that I had skeins on skeins on skeins of yarn everywhere in my life with all these different colors and eventually I was I needed to do something with them <laughs> and I was really interested in learning um, this skill so it's somewhat new I would say for me um, and you'll notice that if you check out my website or or read the book that was my book that was mentioned earlier um, my work is broad in materials and in techniques um, and that's what I like about it. It always pushes me to learn something new, learn a new skill, and it allows the concept to really drive the materiality, to really drive the nature of what it's going to end up looking like. Um, so for this work, it needed to be woven. Um, so I've started to learn about it. Um, weaving is such a deep, amazing, amazing field. So I'm for me, this was like the tip of the iceberg. I can't wait to learn more and do more and just keep putting in years in that weaving time warp that happens when you're sitting at the loom. I love that sort of time warp feeling, but yeah, I'm looking forward to doing a lot more of it. Um, yeah. Thanks, Madeline. I know like just looking through your book, but also just watching that presentation, you have such a fresh, way of talking about something heavy as heavy as the climate crisis and using natural dyes like I'm, I'm just excited to see kind of how how you evolve with it all and and how people from this presentation 
take what you've what you've given us and kind of move forward with it too because everything we do here like on feedback friday it's just these different angles or different glasses we're having you put on to look at, at color and the impact of color and the color in our, of our every in our everyday lives so um anyways i'm hoping people take something from from today and move forward doing something positive let's see uh looks like we did have another question how did the water infuse the woven material mm. okay i imagine it's probably from the blue weaving um the water doesn't touch the material. It's just in an irrigation tube that runs through. Um, so it never actually touches it. Um, it just goes straight to the ceramic vessel, as I call it a rock in, um, at the bottom that I sculpted. And that's where the cornflowers are held and growing. So the water goes straight from the source through the weaving and then to the flower. All right. Which of course you're doing like the the vessel itself too so you're like weaving your natural dyeing and you're creating the vessel that the corn flower is sitting in right renaissance it's ceramic. It's ceramic Renaissance there too <laughs> madeline can i ask you a question um what was the significance of you being in like a tyvek i assume that was you a tyvek garment um when you were doing the watering yeah yeah, um, so for me, well, we were talking about it right before everyone joined us. And for me, um, this work is both really reaching backwards into history and learning. And um, a lot of that research goes back into history and then also thinking about the future and where things are going. Um, so for me, the suit is, is a, I don't want to say it's dark, but it's kind of a, a dark speculation about our future and where things are going. No, I think it's appropriate because like even, you know, in our own studio, right, when we're doing large scale production and we're measuring natural powders, we still have to wear protective equipment. So you can imagine if, if one were working in a more um, hazardous environment that you would have full time protection and my goodness, we just are coming out of a situation where we all had to have full-time protection uh, against the virus. So it, I just thought it was fascinating. Yeah, that suit, and it came, that all was photographed before the pandemic too. Um, feeling a little like prescient or something. Um, I'll also add, I, I suppose that, um, you know, I'm influenced by my surroundings and my partner being a, a farmer albeit a very techy, different type of farming in the city of Detroit. Um, it's not that they're working with hazardous materials, but it's actually in like keeping the purity of those plants and that, that um, confined system, growing plants for flavor instead of for protection from bugs or something per se. So they're always donning these suits and that's where it came from. Um, same with the irrigation tubing. So a lot of that, you know, there's there are quite a few moments of cross pollination that I see between between my partner's work and and mine. That's great. Well, um, Kathy, I think we're going to say thank you to Madeline and um, just kind of, profound thanks, Madeline. Yeah, it is, yeah. Good, really, thank you. Yeah. awesome yeah. gift, total gift yeah. today. Yeah, just the ideas of collaboration with the sun and the disappearance of blue just like yeah i i'm having a i'm having a brain explosion this is wonderful <laughs> raincoat yeah really yeah I mean, thank you so much for having me thanks everyone for listening i appreciate it and thanks for doing all the amazing color work of bringing more colors to people yeah and yeah, again it was a real pleasure get this get this stunning book i'm sorry for the glare the stuff yeah yeah i mean yeah. it's just excellent great. you're gonna put that in chat right oh yeah yeah okay great um or, uh, so oh wait it's my turn right it is your turn Kathy. okay i have my script here uh, so <laughs> <laughs> just a couple of reminders we still have two spots left in the gradient uh class that i'll be teaching in august here in seattle in real life with people near you 
<laughs> we're going to be across the street um, at my friend's Airbnb that has a great backyard. And so we'll be meeting back there and creating all sorts of beautiful shades. Um, and then uh, we're still continuing with our summer series with Abu Bakar Fofana. He's doing a three day mineral mud workshop as well as an online uh, three day indigo class and a master class in creating a, a tunic based on Malian strip cloth, which is called Fidi Mugu. So uh, we're gearing up for that. We hope you can join us. We still have scholarship opportunities available as well as payment plans. So if you have the time, we'd love to see you. Um, we also still have Weld Rich Purple Logwood and Osage Orange Sawdust on sale on the site. And um, I think yesterday we showed that with regular Logwood and Weld, you can create shades of green and not have to go into an indigo pot. If you were in a crazy rush like I was because I needed more colors for a workshop that I was teaching online and I realized I had no greens and I had no indigo available. So um, that's that's fun to do. The recipe is in the Logwood product um, page on, on the website. Um, the other thing that Amy said to me, just stand outside with the roll of this fabric. So I'm not outside, I'm inside, but I have the roll of fabric. This is, <laughs> uh, this is Sally Fox's um, Sea Island cotton lawn that she just sent to us. And it's just extraordinary fabric because like she designed, she, there was a guy that she was working with who was a cotton breeder and he bred this cotton for low water desert conditions. Those of you who know the history of Sea Island cotton, it's an extremely rare variety and it only grows in like the West Indies and on the uh, coast of Georgia and South Carolina. That's where it originated. So very moist, very wet, um, hot, humid, sunny. And the, of course, I can't remember his name, but the um, plant scientist who was breeding the cotton selected and bred for low water and very arid conditions. So no moisture in the air at all. And it's an extraordinary fiber and she had it um, grown for her in New Mexico by the organic farmers that she works with. And then they sent the bales off to Japan. She works with a super high-end mill that makes beautiful fabric. And this, this is it. This is, <laughs> this is the stuff. And it's, it really is quite beautiful. So if you've ever wanted to have a, a fabric that you knew, like how it was created, who created it, who grew it and who milled it. This is like the ultimate transparent supply chain fabric and it's absolutely gorgeous and it helps support Sally. So don't be shy about that either. We've got, um, I think 80 or 90 yards of it in stock. Um, I'm just, are we gonna talk about next week and then picture of the week? Yes. Sure. Okay, yeah. so next week is uh, Independence Day weekend. We will not have a feedback Friday we are going to all um, enjoy that long weekend. But the following week, um, we're really thrilled to have the folks from Threads of Life uh, who are located in Bali. And they are a fair trade business that has from its beginning looked at how do we uh, maintain cultural traditions, uh, patterns, weaving, everything like that amongst this, these far-flung islands in Indonesia where every island has its own tradition and its own methods and bring that to a place where people could purchase these amazing um, textiles. So um, William from Thread Threads of Life and probably a couple of his, um, the people that are, they're going to take us on a, a video tour of Threads of Life so that it'll be pre-recorded because it's midnight there. Um, when they're presenting. However, afterwards, they are going to hold a live trunk show. So you'll be able to view and hopefully meet some of the makers and check out these incredible textiles and also purchase them. So we would love to have you join us. That's not next week, but the week after. Is there a date on that? July 9th? 
Sorry. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Alice. It's the 9th. Yes. Thank you, Alice. July 9th. So um, don't miss this one. It's just the opportunity to see textiles that really aren't being made anymore, except through the efforts of Threads of Life. They also spend quite a bit of time empowering women and women in communities so that they can maintain a, a livelihood. These are the folks that are giving us um, our Simplocos, which is the um, non-aluminum uh, mordant that they use traditionally. And we just received a shipment of Seriops, which is a super dark reddish brown dye similar to Kutch. And it's got this sort of magical multi-day preparation um, so we're, we're testing it right now and hopefully we'll be able to have a little bit of a sample for you to see the beautiful color. So don't miss that. And now, oh. Amy, we are going to do picture of the, what are you looking at? I'm looking at a bald eagle flying okay. around in front of me. It was a coyote earlier. Coyote earlier, but now we got the bald eagle flying. All right. Looking Sorry, for rabbits. My eyes are burning from looking at the sun now. Okay. We have picture of the week. Week, week, week. There's so many pictures of the week. Let's see how I I tested this with Madeline and Kathy earlier, because I don't usually do these kinds of things, but sweet mother of Venus. Hold on. Can you all see that? Did yes. I do it right, Kathy? Okay. Yes. Yes, I created a slide. And I just Okay, if you guys can see the whole thing and I'm not, uh, are we on the side, Kathy, the pictures of us blocking? Yes, no, we're not blocking. We are on a column to the side. Well, I'm not sure how to move you guys unless I just do this and then hit, hey, listen, we're gonna do our best here. So there were so many blue pictures and I got in touch with a couple of people who had put these blue images up on Instagram that had people had, that had tagged us and they weren't able to meet with us but i just wanted to show you some of the range of blue that we got um you know people doing it like bat flower press doing it on paper and i wander through and because we are blocking this other column um you know as people are making indigo vats there's indigo parties it's like an indigo fest going on worldwide right now with the warmer weather which has been really exciting so i just made this little slide up so you could see kind of different people who have been tagging us on Instagram and all the beautiful work that they are doing. And I also wanted, you know, Kathy and I have been talking about a couple different things like um, everybody's fresh leaf indigo is blooming. Lots of, there's been lots of tags on that as well. So, you know, we want to see more of that, but Kathy and I have been talking about next, we're, we're in June. So July being kind of more of a, an indigo focused month. So we'll be talking, I think we'll be kind of adding things in here and there a little bit more about indigo and what people are doing. We also just got our very first drum roll, Kathy. YouTube video up. <laughs> we just, <laughs> oh my God, dear I'm God. not that coordinated. No, uh, not that coordinated, but we just got our first YouTube video <laughs> up. Um, featuring the one, two, three indigo vat and how to make it featuring the marvelous, the amazing Kathy Hattori. You'll see things like her hands, her and hands my mask, <laughs> Kathy it's a bit dated. to different ingredients. But uh, again, with a great voice and really simply the information that you can just listen to. And if you can't make a one, two, three vat after this, we all quit. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's that kathy and there's links to the website with the information on it so much um, information indigo yeah. information on our site there's commonly asked indigo questions it's all on there now if you go on our blog and you search the word indigo you'll see old feedback friday years ago when people would just ask questions and kathy would answer online and not do this but there's yeah commonly asked questions how to make a henna vat, iron vat, indigo, uh, fructose vat, and then the the um, kind of all-in-one vat. Shake a lot of it's a, it's a, a technique that, that um, Kristen Arts uses yep, uh, when she teaches indigo. Yep. So it's like an indigo frenzy. So we'll be promoting a lot of indigo next month. And that's all we got. And we will miss you next week for Independence Day, but we're claiming independence. 
We are. We're, we're taking. We're claiming a vacation day. Thank goodness. Yes. All right. Let's unmute and everybody say hello, goodbye. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. See us on July 9th with Threads of Life presentation and trunk show. Madeline, wow, 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 wow. I am yeah. so thrilled that we were able to share uh, all this beautiful, amazing, provocative, Ooh. encouraging information. It was just fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, All right, guys. Oh, hi, everybody. Hi, Heidi. Hi. 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 Hi, Deanna. Hi. How's it going? <laughs> Ready for a hot weekend. Oh, man. Oh. I already just sent an email to everybody saying, if you want to start earlier on Monday and leave by noon, it's okay with me. That's crazy. It's I mean, perfect. I usually make fun of how wimpy we are in the Pacific Northwest, but this is serious. <laughs> it's hot. Finally, you know? <laughs> yeah, not good. Not anyway, good. take care, All everybody. Right. All right, you. stay cool. Bye. -bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Oh, we're still recording. We're so, oh, we're still recording here. All right. Did you stop it? You want me to? Oh, uh, here I can stop it. Get ready for the cool voice. <laughs>